approach the genre of law when you're preaching through the Old Testament. What is law? Well, we're not talking about every command or every imperative that's in the Bible. Specifically, we're talking about the law that was given in the books of Moses, either directly by Moses, the Ten Commandments, or it follows in what we call the Levitical Code. Certainly, it's some of the most dense and interesting aspects of Scripture. So here we are at our first in the, or second installment, and we're already dealing with one of the toughest genres to preach. How do you preach law? Well, let's walk through a couple of things that we mentioned in the book. First of all, you preach the law in the spirit of grace. If you study the Old Testament, you realize very quickly that every law that God gave to the children of Israel, he did so in a way to protect them. So although we look at the Old Testament covenant of law and see it so differently to the grace that God has given us in Christ, which Paul extracts in the book of Galatians, for example, and explains very clearly, however, they're different. The grace of God that has given us into the New Testament is only possible because we weren't able to keep the legal code in which he established in the Old Testament. And so their relationship really can't be separated. And all that to say, when you're preaching the law, you have a wonderful opportunity to show how God has come to fulfill the law through the person of Christ, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, when he came and fulfilled the law and told us how to really live and walk out the law, the requirement of the law in grace. So preach the law in the spirit of grace. The second thing is, and maybe this is most practically helpful, preach the law in the context of narrative. The reason why we put law under the genre, the macro level genre of narrative, is because law is always given in the context of story. So if you're staring at some text that's dense and seemingly impossible, you always preach the story that surrounds it because it's gonna allow the law to come alive and allow it to make more sense. And we'll illustrate that in just a minute. The third thing is this, consider micro exposition. What do I mean micro exposition? Well, my understanding of expository preaching or text driven preaching is not limited to sermon length. When you preach an Old Testament narrative, for example, you might preach three, four, five, six chapters in one, in one swath, in one sermon. At the same time, when you're preaching through the Ten Commandments, when you're getting through this, this legal code that God has given to Israel, you're going to have to unpack, for example, what exactly is covetousness. It's not all embedded in that text. There's the Hebrew word there, but as you pan out through all of Scripture as to how it is really unfolded through the rest of the Word of God, you'll find macro exposition working from the inside and then working itself out. But thirdly, also consider, or fourthly, macro exposition. In other words, when you talk about one of these Ten Commandments, figure out what it means in the larger context of the book. That will influence its meaning as well. Fifthly, note any explicit New Testament connection. Every time God gives a law, if it is a virtue, and there's several virtue lists in Scripture, 1 Peter, and then also Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit, if this law is leading to any virtue, then ultimately a New Testament author is going to pick up on that. It's not that isn't it nice to make these connections, it's imperative that we make these connections. Because Christ has fulfilled the law and the voice of Christ is seen through the rest of the New Testament in the epistles and the things that he wanted to say to them but did not have time to say to them. And so all of that is extended to the rest of the New Testament. So it's critical that we make the connection between the Old Testament law and the New Testament text that explain it and, or, and complement it. So finally, show how this individual text fits into the whole of salvation history. Every law was trying to develop a virtue. Those virtues are teaching us about the character of God, but all of that, both the virtue and the character of God, is explicitly given to us in the person of Christ, consummated in him. So show how this individual law through the trajectory of gospel history, through the salvation history, is ultimately fulfilled and completed in Christ. So the sermon example that I gave at the end of that was taken from a sermon I preached last summer in a church that was preaching through the Ten Commandments. I was assigned to preach Exodus chapter 27 through 11. So there are two commands in there. One is to not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And the second is to honor the Sabbath day and make it holy. And that's a big ask to cover both of those things in one sermon, but there is a relationship. When we respect the name of God, we're honoring his reputation. And when we respect the day of God, we're honoring the rest that he has required of us. And so what I try to do simply in the sermon is first begin it in the context of the narrative. 
These laws don't really understand, make sense unless you see them as God is leading the children of Israel out of bondage into the promised land. They're in the wilderness and God is giving them the standard by which he expects them to uphold. And so I gave the narrative context. Then mention each of these two commandments and tried to, as quickly as I can, tried to identify the New Testament parallel so they could see that this idea of Sabbath rest, which later is completed in Christ, and honoring the name of God are both explicitly addressed in the New Testament. And then finally, in way of conclusion, I made applications that didn't highlight the Old Testament text as much as they highlighted the New Testament text not trying to depart from the text in which I'm called to preach, but rather I'm trying to show the canonical relationship. And the one here is fascinating. The reason why understanding the Sabbath rest is so important is because in the book of Hebrews, it becomes clear that Sabbath rest is a metaphor, not only for heaven, but also for what Christ has done for us when we enter into his rest. In other words, Christ finished his work and then rested, and now we rest in his finished work.